introduce, first of all, I don't know how many, some of you I know know uh, Barbara. She was Barbara Moore when she was in Culver, went to school here, and um, it, it has come down all the way from Gary today. So we're really appreciative that she came. She's Barbara Cope now, and as you'll see on the handout, she's very accomplished. She's worked in education in Gary and just a number of things. And, uh, and of course, Jim Harper, many of you know him. And he went to school here also and came back here several years ago after a, a successful career of his own. He's very accomplished in his own right and, you know, and has done so much in the Culver community. Um, he's a familiar face to many of us and has, you know, gives so much to the community. So um, without further ado, uh, please welcome Barbara Cope and Jim Harper. children that I grew up with, uh, it's a wonderful experience for me. As a matter of fact, he has one picture, and I'm not going to do anything with pictures because I know you probably are going to, are you going to show yeah, some we'll of these on the, do all that so I'll here. wait until he shows them, but I saw a picture, you know how, have you ever had someone to bring a picture of you when you were a young or a child that you had never seen before, and <coughs> you just stare at it, oh, there I am, I look different, I didn't remember I looked like that. Well, I saw a picture of Betty, and I mean, for a moment, it just took me back. It just, I felt like I was going to be weepy over this, having seen this picture, because I left here at, at uh, like I said, when I was in seventh grade, and I didn't see Betty again until uh, she was in her cast. And so, it was really just a very eerie and very uh, strange experience. But, um, I don't know whether any of you remember the Moores or not. My father's name was William Moore. He worked at the academy as a mop man, a janitor. My father was a handicapped person. He, I had four sisters, Wilma, Mary, Elva, and Lucille. Elva and Lucille were much older than us. Uh, my oldest sister was 18 years old when I was born, so you might not remember them, but you might remember, some of you might remember Wilma or Mary. Now Mary was here, came back uh, two years ago to attend an, a <coughs> function with her graduating class. She didn't graduate from here, but she came back to be with her class as they uh, celebrated their uh, one of their um, reunions. And she was so happy to do that. She's quite hard of hearing, but she just had a wonderful time. And I don't know who the gentleman was. I thought it was so funny. I remember he just took, uh, I don't know whether he remembered Mary or not, but he came up and he put his arm around her and he just followed her around. And 
hugged her and I said, Mary, do you remember? She said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm a fortunate person, even though we were very, very poor, but we didn't know we were poor. We thought we were middle class or maybe upper class, <laughs> because we lived among such wonderful people and we had such an a easy life. I always say, uh, we grew up on the same menu that the boys at the academy ate, we just had it the next day. <laughs> Dad came home every night with a quart of milk and with ice cream, the, the, that wonderful uh, ice cream that they made. If there was no ice cream like the ice cream they made at the academy for those boys. So we, uh, we were fortunate. And I think I was fortunate because of my education that was started here. I, um, I had a rough start in school. I started with Miss Weissong, I don't know if you remember Miss Weissong, who then married and became Miss Myers. And I was in Miss Weissong, and she was a young, pretty woman, and I was the baby of the family, so I wasn't really into school, you know, I was just amazed at what was going on, and my mother, you know, she didn't really want me to go to school, I was her, the last child. And so I didn't learn to read in the first grade. And I was shocked at the end of the first grade, they told my mother, you know, we think Barbara needs to do first grade again. Well, <laughs> but guess what they did? They put me in Miss Edna's class. Anybody know Miss Edna? <laughs> Miss Edna could take a dog off of the street and they would read. They may not be able to do anything, but they could read. <laughs> remember the story. She told you a story about each sound. E was eh. And it was about a man who couldn't hear good and he would say eh. And she would say, everybody had to say eh. When you got to it, you said, I was the best reader in the class. And I it was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, I tell people this all the time because I am not ashamed of it. It, is the, it was the seat of my education. And uh, after that, I never had another uh, another thought of not going forward because I knew I could read. read and do anything. I'm going to sit down now because it was a mistake putting me up here first. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've got lots of things to say. And then I want to say Thelma, this wonderful lady sitting right here, Thelma Lily, we call her. She got Thelma after she left. <laughs> She's Thelma Lily forever to us. She's done so much to help get this information and collection together. I've looked at pictures she sent in, and I just, oh, it just stirs my heart because I see things that I, I had absolutely forgotten. And so I publicly thank her. I'm sure you probably were going to say something to her also. And I hope that maybe we get a chance for her to come up here and say some things to her. <laughs> she knows more about the history as it went along than I do, as I said, at the mine ended at the seventh grade, unfortunately. But it gave me my start in life, and I think it was probably the seat of everything else that I've been able to do, and I, I'm, I'm just so thankful for uh, Culver to have given this to me. Jim, you made a couple of comments that I would like to pick up on. One was provincial. I have often said that I came from one of the most provincial towns probably in the world. Definitely in the United States and definitely the most provincial I've ever heard. The interesting thing about provincial and provincialism and prejudice, they both start with a P. And in some respects, they both have the same in effect. It all depends on how you look at it. I know people who have lived here in Culver for 25 years and they still feel like outsiders. I came back after being away for 40 years and felt like I was home. And that's how the community accepted you. 
because you were a part of that community, you were always home. And even in the times when I was gone, if I was here, I was Jim. Unfortunately, they called me by the name that they always did in school. I was James. I quit being James when I graduated from high school and went away to college. But here, I am James, and I still get called James by a lot of people that know me. And I'm egotistical enough, Jim, to think that I'm not surprised that we have this kind of a problem. For one reason, I'm sure some of you are saying, what is that ding-dong going to say? <laughs> uh, I can't imagine him being worthy of listening to. I've got to go see what it is. <laughs> You say anything. <laughs> I hope that we're able to enlighten you as to one aspect of the community of Culver this morning. I don't know if it's going to be earth shaking. I do know that some of you are going to know more about some of the people's names that are mentioned than I do, simply because some of you may have had more contact with those people in your classes and in your dealings. It's also interesting, when the first article came out, I got responses from as far away as Arizona. This time when the paper came out, I got several phone calls, a couple from people that I really didn't know. They give me a name and yeah, I may have heard the name. They give me the situation in which they know about Culver and yes, I have to relate to that. And then they start talking about people that they knew, and you definitely relate to that. With that, I'm going to let Jeff get started. He's got a bunch of pictures that he will be showing you, and hopefully we can give some enlightenment as those pictures are shown. And I do want to say, and we, I am honored that the gentleman is here and, and her guests. Um, it's absolutely true that many of these pictures are here because of her, and I, I didn't know she wanted to call her out, but it's already done, so I'll do it. Um, we could have a separate program, and probably should, with just her, you know, talking. Um, just in the short time we spent together last summer, I could tell she had a million stories that everybody should hear, but so many of these pictures came from her, and we're really, really grateful to her, and, um, you know, and as you'll see as you hear this story, her mother's name and her family's name are just central to the whole story, so... Anyway, we're really glad. I didn't know until what yesterday, the day before, that she'd be here. So, I you know, didn't have time to put her on the spot. Any more than this. But anyway, um, you guys can jump in with this anytime. Um, let me back up. Let's jump in the gun a little bit. Culver's the, the African American history of Culver really begins in the okay. <laughs> mind if it's up. begins in the 1890s. Really, uh, Henry Harrison Culver, when he decided to start a, a military academy here. Um, in 1894 is when it first opened. Now you did have a lot of students, and around the same period, the Missouri Military Academy in Mexico, Missouri, burned, um, and it pretty much burned to the ground. And they had a lot of students, and uh, Culver sent word to them and said, "You have the boys, we have the academy, and let's get together." So they brought a lot of the students from Missouri Military Academy, and with them came. Um, the, really the seeds of the, at least the lasting African American community in Culver. Um, you know, it's a different time. It was a different time. So what you're talking about at that time was largely um, people who were serving as you know, laborers, in some cases servants, that kind of thing. Um, there was also the Lake community. You know, around the same period, we just talked about the Vonnegut's. The Vonnegut's were an example of a family um, they were a very prominent family in Indianapolis, but there were many like that who came to the east shore of the lake who had wealth, and again, that this was a different time. They would have brought with them, and we have, I have some photos I just got since the presentation of Vonnegut, that you can see some of the African-American staff that they had working for them. Um, you see this a lot going back in some of the lake community. So the lake community and the academy really brought this population here. Um, we'll hear some names, too. One of the interesting things, and this comes from Thelma's collection. Um, oh, I gotta remember to hit that. Sorry. It's on auto, there we go. All right, um, this is amazing. Um, this is pretty early. This is probably not long after you know, uh, the arrival of some of these people. This is probably around 1900, early 20th century. Um, if you don't know about the, the Negro League baseball teams, 
this was all over the country. And, you know, again, different time, uh, things were segregated. Um, the Negro Leagues were, you know, a, a big force in sports in America. Jackie Robinson came out of them later. Um, in Indiana, most of the uh, most of the uh, uh, Negro League teams were in large cities. Indianapolis had a, a team I think called the Clowns. Um, you know, South Bend I think had a team. Evansville, Culver actually had a team, which is pretty amazing. I mean, that's kind of a something to, to to be aware of. They call themselves the Comets, and that same spirit as Indianapolis Clowns. I, I wasn't there, obviously, and I haven't studied it in depth, but I get the sense that it was a it was something along the lines of the Harlem Globetrotters and that there was, there was some comedy, there was some entertainment that went beyond just the sport itself. Um, it's really hard to read this. Uh, <laughs> but who we see in this picture, we believe, is Charlie Wade, an unidentified coach, Luther Witted, uh, Roy Scott, and David Witt. Younger pictures. We'll see. We'll hear those names again. I skipped one. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> this picture, again, the comics. Uh, David Witted, Charlie Wade, unknown players, Roy Scott, Roy Watts, and an unknown player in the front row. Um, I think I left a few out. But anyway, great Coleman picture. Jackson. Coleman Jackson. Coleman Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Coleman Lynn. Yeah. Lynn. yeah. And I have that on the website, but I, I missed him on the caption. Yeah. Uh, Coleman Jackson. Yeah. Just amazing. Jeff, which one is, is a Roy Watts again, please? On the end, on the middle row. Oh, oh, yes. Who is that? Roy Watts. Roy Watts. Okay. We'll see him again, too. <laughs> <laughs> Another interesting thing about Culver is uh, is how early, and I stumbled on this when I first started really digitizing local history about three or four years ago, I'd get a 1913 yearbook out, or 1919. And there were African American faces in there. It was, you know, the school was was integrated, which in some parts of America, many, or most parts of America, would have been unheard of at the time. I had someone come in a couple summers ago, or maybe it was last summer, from the it was yeah the Indiana Basketball History Association. I may be mixing up the name, but anyway, it's a statewide group, and they he came in and said, we think Culver has some of the first, if not the first, or one of the first, I should say, if not the first, integrated basketball team. In, in Indiana. Um, here we see um, Witted is in here somewhere. Okay. And I had the caption. Oh, wait, right there. Wait. Wade is right here. So Witted and Wade, and this is from 1922. That's the basketball team, or at least part of it. Again, you get a picture of the, the, the kind of you know, uh, immersement or immersion, I should say, immersion of the African American community in Culver. Uh, the Culver citizen had, I mean, basically a lot of the citizens at the time were sort of a gossip, you know, gossip. Um, and they had, you know, borough happenings and Monterey doings, and you know, all these every little every little niche had its own column. And it's amazing you don't see this every week, but from time to time you see this column in the colored circles. And again, a dated, antiquated term. Colored, but but at the time not a disrespectful term, as Jim has pointed out many times. Um, and you see, it's the same kind of thing. Mrs. Carey Thomas was called to Chicago by the serious illness of a friend. Mrs. Johnson died last week at her home. Mr. and Mrs. Robert Hill spent Sunday in Chicago. You know, this is the kind of thing. But, but this is, you know, there is underneath this, you know, underneath this, this surface is the fact that these people were considered enough a part of the community that their social events, their social doings were considered worthy of press right along with everybody else, which is pretty interesting. I just threw this in because it's you know, sequential. 1938 called for citizens. This is Charles Dickerson Jr. Uh, the basketball team was doing really well. Uh, he ranks as one of the best ball handlers on the club. Um, he's been a member of High Wife for four years, the Boys Glee Club, won letters in baseball and track, treasurer of the freshman class, secretary of the junior High Wife. Not somebody who's, you know, I mean, yeah, he's clearly, he's, he's part of the class. You know, he's part of the, 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 the school class. <coughs> Um, a lot of the African American community um, that came here or lived here 
were employed by the academy, uh, especially the weight staff. Uh, up until the mid 50s, the academy had all black waiters or all black wait staff. Um, and that's how the, the cadets ate. They marched in, they were seated, they were served by these, these waiters. So that was a, a large source of the African American community's employment. This actually is probably a little bit out of order, but um, this is Roy and Lily Scott, his wife, at a, at a Culver Academy faculty wedding. This is probably one of the Culver, remember the Culver family, uh, in the 1950s. You might mention Thomas grandparents. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. We're a little out of order on this. I hope I have to. Because that should, we should be getting to her. This is a similar picture, Roy Scott. Keith Scott. At the Culver Homestead, you know, still there on the, uh, on the campus, or just off the campus, the Academy on the Shore Drive. Again, 1950s. This is a, a very exemplary picture of the time. You know, this is uh, Charlie Dickerson, who was the head waiter for years and years and years and years. Uh, and behind him is Roy Watts. And there, uh, yeah, the second in command, inspecting the waiters at the Culver Academy. This was a very common scene uh, at the time. And I'm told, see, this is where you guys jump in. <laughs> I'm told uh, they ran a pretty tight ship with the, with the guys they had working with them. Be mindful of the fact it was a military school and everything over there was pretty much military rep. So you had the same kind of inspections, the same kind of orderliness. And in that mess hall, it was very formal dining. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So. What I hear is if any I worked there one summer and swore to God, if you let me out, I'd never go back. <laughs> I hear is if any of these guys, you know, if they cross the line, they shouldn't, whatever, if they, you know, he'd have them out on the next train, you know. Next train, huh? <laughs> See, these are the loud words. Again, this is from the same series as earlier. This is um, Chief Scott and one of the Culver brothers, one of them, Andrew Harrison Culver's sons on the Culver homestead. This is a lot of work. This is much earlier. This is probably the 1890s. It's really hard to see. I apologize. It's really tiny. I need to get a better version of this. But this is Henry Harrison Culver's wife, Emily Jane Culver. And this is some sort of tea or something she's having at the Culver homestead. It's probably hard to make out, but there is an African American lady serving with tea there. Again, you know, typical of the day. Here is Sheep Scott. Uh, you know, this is sort of a classic photo. Um, he, he uh, what was his actual position? Head of the barracks. Head of the barracks, okay. And this photo, for example, I got out of Bob Hartman's book on Academy history. He points out in the text that uh, uh, Sheep Scott was kind of an unofficial counselor for these cadets. I mean, they came to him with problems. They came to him with if their girlfriend was giving them trouble, they were going to run away from the Academy or whatever. He was. He was, he was sort of their counselor, you know. Um, and he carried that over to a lot of people in town as well. Not only did he do that, he provided a lot of sports equipment for all kinds of kids here in town, uh, all kinds of sports equipment. And he was just free in his giving of himself and was accessible to anybody and everybody in town. I think he was involved in coaching some of the town teams. I think I've seen his name associated with that, too. But yeah, he, he, he just, he's somebody who, um, you know, seems to have left such an impression on so many people, you know, just in the community and at the academy. I mean, he was, you know, just a very, well, again, we'll see him here, you know, hear more about him. Here's another picture of him from the Elmas collection. Here he is at the academy. This is an interesting picture from probably the 1890s or early, early 1900s. The reason I included this, besides the fact it's a neat picture, yeah, it's the depot. But the rumor is that that uh, is Roy Scott's daughter, Thelma Hodges, became Thelma Hodges. That's the rumor. I don't know if that's true. I had to throw that in. We even talked about it in the interview. It's, it's published there. Um, anyway, this, this young girl at the time, that's the rumor. Don't know. 
Don't know. <laughs> Here she is, Thelma Scott. This is her 1920 yearbook photo. Um, I think she was in. She was a, uh, not a junior sophomore. In the picture. This is the same shot that you kind of see her surrounded by classmates here. Class photo. This is a great photo. And again, this is from Donna's collection. Um, this is 1924, uh, just after she graduated from high school. And what's great about this photo, she's getting on the train. You can see the little Kreisberger Hotel building back there, the big brick one. It's still there. This is the depot at Culver. Um, she's getting ready to get on the train, and she's headed to Washington, D.C. to go to uh, Howard University, which is so neat in so many ways. First of all, she was a woman, and she's going away to school in 1924, which is pretty not, you know, not completely unusual, but fairly unusual, because she was also an African-American woman doing this. And I think it says something about her, and we'll hear more about her. Um, she went away and eventually became a teacher, uh, married a man with a master's degree in, was it in German? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just, this is what I don't know if that's Sharon or not. But Thelma, look how classy your mother was. Yeah, she's classy. And, yeah. she, and, she, and she always had her entire life. Mm -hmm. She had trunks of clothes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she was amazing. Yeah, isn't that great? She yeah, was, the way she, she dressed. Was great. Oh. Isn't that great? On a domestic cell. But again, the same, the same period again. Look how mm -hmm. she's just ready to take on the world. Um, it's a great photo. Mm -hmm. Nope, same one. Here she is. She came back to Culver in the 19... She was here in the 70s. I'm not sure exactly when she came back. But uh, she taught away from Culver for most of many years. Did she? Not long? Okay. So she spent a lot of her life then back in Culver. Okay. I remember her as a child. That was a good memory of her as a child. Um, and that's probably how many of us... That's how I remember her. Here she is in a later photo in the late 1980s. This photo actually went along with this, which was the announcement of her memorial service, March 21st, 1990. Um, and that's, that's the year she passed away. And you can see that I won't read it, but this long uh, sort of list of her accomplishments and her you know, community involvement. And she really did have a lot of community involvement. She was involved in real estate here, uh, in a lot of business things, um, business ventures. I remember her running an antique store downtown or being involved in it. Um, she was really involved in the community in, in various capacities, you know, um, and really respected. I got a piece of information just this past Thursday on how knowledgeable she was in terms of picking up information that other people didn't have concerning businesses that were either going up or coming down in Culver, and no one could ever figure out how she acquired this information. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who told me it about it. <laughs> but someone very close to a source that was really interesting. Well, I've had so many people say they would go to her for all kinds of advice, and, and she was just very incredibly sharp, incredibly, you know, able and accomplished and yeah. Very proud of her heritage. She was the one that got that, uh, remember we used to have the end man and have the, uh, what was it called, the show? The two end men were black no more. The show. show. Oh, yeah. The yeah. 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 used to do it. And she pleased, that is demeaning to us, and those of you should not have this kind of program. And she did get that stopped. Mm. Did she really? Yes, she did. She was a good spearhead of that. And everybody admired her for it. And wow. absolutely in innocence, I think people were using it just because of the comedy involved. But uh, you know, it, it was demeaning, and she knew it, and she got some. That's amazing. See, I didn't know that that was the case. And Jim and I talk in the interview about those minstrel shows. Um, I'm sure you probably know what those were. Um, but it was a popular form of American entertainment in the early part of the 20th century, earlier part. And our local Alliance Club, of which I am now a member, sponsored that on an annual basis as one of their fundraisers. Even to the point where a lot of us in high school, myself included, 
assisted in those productions. Right. Right. <laughs> you didn't think like much of it at the time. No, it was just a form of entertainment. And either fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know which, I had not had ingrained in me that kind of a stigma with it. Right. Now would be a different story, but then it was not the same. And she was, she was thoughtful of everybody, white and black. She was just, she was an individual. She was a Methodist too. I'll have to add. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I didn't know that about her starting I made the comment as this we started that many of you in here probably have a much more information <laughs> than Barbara and I have. <coughs> That's great. She That's also great. helped the first city. First city, oh, she was oh, oh, Rector's my cousin was visiting from New York, and he had taken my bike, and he rode around the lake, and he just loved culture. And on his way into town, he stopped at Rector's Drugstore to have some drink, and they didn't serve him. And he came home and said, I'm down, because uh, she wanted to wind this whole lake, so I stopped the drugstore for some drink, and they wouldn't serve him. She said, which drugstore? <laughs> he said, the one uh, on that side of the street. She says, Rector, she went to school with him. What was his first name? Stephen yeah. Rector. Just come on, let's go. So we had guests in the house. They all walked up. Charles and I came in the back. <laughs> Daddy, Uncle Lyra, Stevie, Stevie's parents. She marched uptown to Rector's drugstore and sat at the counter. <laughs> and he came and she said, Dumb, what do you want? She said, We want to be served. And I understand that you did not serve my nephew. This is my nephew right here. <laughs> and she said, oh, I didn't know it was your nephew. She says, what difference does that make? She says, we want to be served. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, he gave me hope, and then they walked out. <laughs> 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 my mother said she was with them in Rochester, and they wouldn't serve him. Right. Because your mother was with them. Right. The Methodist Church grew. Right. 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 Yeah. <coughs> And it was a red, it was right next to my father's barber shop, and they went there right. all the time. Right. I mean, my mother was just mortified. Right. <laughs> right. They weren't in server. But after that, it was no problem. We always went to the other restaurant. <laughs> 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 we had better service. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you filled that in because Martha Ryman told me that story slightly differently. She remember well, but she remembers Donald being involved in the League of Women Voters, yeah. and they apparently. Got involved in that issue, I guess she said, <laughs> and uh, that included uh, Mrs. Newman and Martha's mom, Mrs. Payson, and they all got involved in that whole. <coughs> and I think Mrs. Newman maybe gave part of the. I don't. I'm going to stop. Step back because I don't remember anyway. But yeah, that I'm glad you told that because that really that's great. So there what we go. What was that city? Well, it was in the fifties. It was. Had to be like 52, 51, 52. Martha remember being early 50s. She thought it was connected with the, we'll get to this, but the, the, the drownings of the, the African American children. But it happened early. Okay, okay. See, this is great. Yeah, what I remember about Thelma, uh, we knew her as Aunt Thelma. We called her Aunt Thelma. And my sister Mary. Always was down there with Aunt Thelma and talking to her. And then when Thelma Lily came along, she babysat for her. So she was six years older than her. And I remember Mary came home from Aunt Thelma's one day uh, and he was talking to my mother. Now, you know, in those days, they didn't tell us anything. We learned about the birds and the bees the best way we could find them. Five year olds no more than I knew. <laughs> So she was so excited, she was telling my mother something, but they wouldn't let me hear with it, I couldn't hear with it. So pretty soon my mother did give me some information. She said, well, you know, I was going to have a child at her house, a little, uh, I said, is it going to be a girl or a boy? Well, we don't know. I said, oh, can I go play with them? <laughs> well. I don't know, I, I thought it was good. I could see somebody my age, we were going to be skinny. <laughs> 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 
I was, and it took me, it took nine months. <laughs> but that was the best dress baby in town. You never saw so many uh, lace dresses and eyelet dresses. I had never seen it. She was like a doll. She just laid there and let people take pictures of her. She was Sharing with it, Betty and Eleanor Smith, and then uh, there's so the thing Ele goes, Eleanor is not Smith, Eleanor is Turner. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Again, this is, this is a 1944, I believe, birthday party. Uh, same, we're writing the same day. And we see Amy and Sharon and Betty and Eleanor and Thelma <laughs> Lily and then Winston Smith and an unidentified child. Actually, that was a Winston Turner. Winston Turner, Turner right? Yeah. yeah, I got the Smith Turner yeah. thing. Yeah. And I think that the, the unidentified one is Paul Rob, Robinson, I think, was his last name. Okay. And he was one of the kids at Trout. Okay. And yeah. yeah, that's this. Mm. Uh, you were right, I was wrong. 1947. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, January of 1947. Um, this was a, you know, this was a, a memory that, from what I understand, everybody who was around at the time has sort of burned into their, into their. Um, these children, there were five children, you know, on their way to the academy. It was winter, they were walking across the ice near what we call Indian Trails today. And the ice uh, was weak, probably where the springs were, I don't know, but um, they fell through. Um, one of them, I can't remember which boy, pushed one of the girls out. Pushed Winston, Winston pushed Turner Eleanor pushed his sister Eleanor up and out. Up and out. And she lived as a result. All the other four died. Um, from everybody I talked to who was around, it was just a, a community tragedy. I mean, the whole community um, just you know, came together. And, it was, it was just a, a tragedy for everyone. Um, yeah, I think there's those now. Ah, sorry. I have to tell you, uh, a lady said, I got this yesterday in the mail. And this is a letter from a lady named Millie or Mildred Issam. And she wrote, she was a, a classmate of Betty and Eleanor. She sent this photo, and she remembered very well. In fact, for a college class, she wrote an essay on this drowning. Um, she was very close to uh, her, it was Betty. Yeah, she was close to Betty. And in fact, it turns out she said she has no memory of this. It was so traumatic for her, she blocked a lot of it. But apparently, they buried Betty in Billy's van uniform. She donated that. Someone said someone came up to her later and said that was really nice of you to do that. She had no memory of it. And the band director at the time even raised money to replace her Millie's uniform. Uh, it's a really, I'm going to try to ask her permission to put this on our website. It's a really, it's kind of a moving essay because she then talks about going to uh, Betty's grandmother's house and Betty lives with her grandmother and the two are crying together and everything. She could never bring herself to the house again. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. I just got a call from her a couple days ago. She said, I, I have something pertaining to Culver's. Black History, I'd like to send you what's the address, and I get this in the mail yesterday. She included some other photos, too, but that was really, really neat. So. Just as an aside, her brother was one of my classmates. Okay. Another item uh, that I think is of interest, my husband was talking about this, and he was there to help rescue these children, yeah. and he said, I said, why were they out on the lake if this is unsafe? And he said that the Academy used to show movies free of cost 
and they were all on their way to see the movie, and they were in a hurry, so they were crossing the lake rather than going around. And it was a spring that yeah. caused the ice to <laughs> Real quick, I say, Miss Millie, in her letter, she says, I was going to go with them, and I had a cold that day, so I stayed home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Stella was, I was in Stella's class. The reason they were going to the movies was that everybody in town was at the ball game. There was the attorney, and they had a really hot game, a hot team that year. Everybody had gone to Plymouth. And the African American children were not allowed to go. No, that, that's not true. Because I was there. You were at the game? I was at the game. Well, oh, <laughs> maybe it was for some reason, but I had always been. Those, they probably chose not to go, but I was at that game, so oh, I know that. I know. But that's, everybody was gone from town that night. That's basically true, that part of it. There was a law in the books that. African Americans had to be out of London by yeah. 6 p.m. So my mom actually found that when she was the library director in the 70s. And the Mrs. Issa refers to that in her letter, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I was just wondering about the Black Panthers and the much money, but I remember they sent me back to the funeral. I'll never forget that, uh, even though I can't remember it in detail, but I do remember just going to two funerals in one day, two for Stella, I don't know, there were two passes, I can't remember who they were, and in the afternoon it seemed like it was another funeral. And I, it's just a blur, but I do remember Betty in a band uniform. I'm glad you said that, because then I thought, well, why did they use her? Why did they use her bad uniform? Because she didn't they could use her bad And I think she even had her saxophone. I think her saxophone. Oh, really? Which one she was in? I don't remember even seeing Stella, even though she was my very, very good friend. I don't remember looking at her at all. Um, and that's one of the most traumatic memories I have. Yeah. Yeah. Martha Ryman Martha Ryman told me this story, it's the first one I heard from. She said there was a siren at the time that would tell you that someone had gone through the ice and it chilled you when you heard it. Jeff went into my house. He thought I was with him because I always used to hang around. Oh, okay. He came to the house that early that morning. Where's the first down the first down the road? And then that's when he learned that the girl was with him. Yeah. Were you gonna say? Jeff, I was here the night. It was a Friday or Saturday night. I'd have been 17 years old. <laughs> I took my dad, and we'd come up for that weekend. I took my dad's car over where the subway, the convenience store is, and the beachfront was covered with fire trucks and people running and ambulances and floodlights and trying to get automobile lights shining on the lake. And I pulled into that South Shore garage. Was that the name of the garage at that time there? And... Uh, we were told that evening that these four children had gone through the ice. And I never could verify this, and I don't know if the paper ever mentioned this, but we also were told that one of the coaches at the academy dived through the hole and tried to help get those, find those kids and get them out of there in time. But, but the four were. I had been told they burned the fire chief that I died. Was that attitude. who it was? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it may have been someone else too. Okay. But yeah. Okay. Um, sort of switching gears from that. Yeah. Um, this is fascinating. This is from 1913. Uh, actually, right behind us, there was an African Methodist Episcopal Church in Calder, which I think is fascinating. Um, it was known as the Rollins Chapel, and it literally sat, if I'm facing this way, it was back here. There's an empty lot there now. 
Not a huge church, as you can see by the lot. Um, but it was there, obviously, from about 1913. Uh, they talk about it being, oh you know, yeah, it was 20 by 30, and it cost about $450. <laughs> It was there until at least the 60s, and I'm told the, the Methodist ladies use it as their first uh, thrift store. And they borrowed it for that after it stopped being a church, of course. Um, and I have found out since, Jeff, that the current Lutheran church in town looked at the possibility of buying it for their service, but and had a service in there and decided it was just way too small and wouldn't purchase it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the church of the library basement. So. Yeah. Met in the library basement. They met in the library basement. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. This is an article I just happened to stumble on from the 30s uh, about a folklore recital from the uh, AME church for Rollins Chapel. Now, it was actually it took place at the, I thought it took place, yeah, it took place at the Methodist church. But it was, they were doing spirituals and that sort of thing, and, and it was in a concert. I thought that was kind of interesting. And, um, which is, where the Which is where the new library extension is now. Yeah. Um, George Rollins, this is the notice of his death. I don't have the date on it. Um, but he was, of course, the, the church was the Rollins Chapel. He came in 1899 from Missouri, was employed in the Culver Military Academy. You know, as, as was true of so many people that you know, involved. The Rollins Chapel is a lasting memorial to his life. He saw the need of a church in Culver for the people of his race. He therefore donated the ground on which the edifice, which still stands, was built and he has been a hard worker in this congregation. Which is interesting. He left uh, a widow and two children, Dr. H.T. Rollins of Detroit and Mrs. C.L. Watts of Colton. Roy, 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 Roy. Was Charles. Okay, so that was Rollins. That's interesting. I didn't know that either. So. But it was a tiny church. I remember it very well. I attended there and it was very tiny. But we used to give plays and we had all the time. And there were only, I think, about Maybe eight rows of Jews. <laughs> 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 you know, if anybody has a photo of that, we've been looking all over for a photo of Ronald Chapel and haven't been able to find it. <laughs> anybody? Have, uh, just some photos. Charles Dickerson Jr. James Dickerson. This is. Put this in. This is a great photo. Um, <laughs> this is just, this is, you can just see though, this is a group uh, including Thelma Hodges, uh, boy, there's a lot of names, I won't go through all the names, well, I guess I can. You can see Levada Pierce, Elsie Bird, Adelaide Weaver, an unidentified couple standing, uh, Bob Hodges, Smoke Pierce, Charlie Weaver, Ace Bird, Roy Scott, Roy Lear, unidentified you. Um, but again, you can see these, these folks got together, and, and I mean, it's just an interesting picture of the time. You know? um, a kind of a unique, look at how they're dressed. Look at, I mean, they're, they're having a social time. Um, it's an interesting photo. This is a familiar face. <laughs> <laughs> These are again just some photos from largely from Thelma Lewis Torch and Mr. Brownlee, a rumor, and this is Gussie Smith's house. Um, Thelma, Thelma Hodge's mother, Lily Scott, in her kitchen at home on Main Street, called just south of downtown. Lily and Roy Scott's 50th wedding anniversary. Leela Dickerson. Charles Dickerson in a little bit later years. Um, another gathering, Adelaide Weaver, Elsie Bird, Nadine Bird, Babe Scott, and Mr. Bell, Zena Witted. Um, one of the interesting things, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here, um, there was a whole community, as you can see here, of, and as, as Jim Peterson mentioned in the beginning, of at least 30 families living in the town of Culver, very much integrated into the community of Culver. Um, I do need to throw this in. I should say airman. This is, many of you know Mick Henley, Aaron Culver, involved in Lions Club. This is his brother, Bernard Ponder. Um, he was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. And he flew many sorties over Italy in World War II. He actually retired to Kings Lake. Mick ended up moving to Culver and still lives in Culver. But he brought in these great photos. 
of his brother. What happened to his brother? He passed away in the 90s. He did, you know, make it through the war and everything. Those are three pictures of his brother. Um, this is an unidentified photo I just got last week of over at the Academy. That's great. That's Cap Ray. Oh, no longer unidentified. <laughs> And once someone called me just this week and remembered how he always walked around with his big fur coat. Right. <laughs> yes. These are some pictures that Barbara said. Yes. That the lady on the left is my uh, my mother's sister, Oni. Her name is Oni Ross. Next to her is my oldest sister, Lucille. Jenny Lucille. She went to school in Colorado, but did not graduate. Next to her is my other sister, Elva Moore. And she also attended school at Colbert and uh, but did not graduate. And I do not know who the lady from the library is. I don't know if I was too late to tell me. I don't know. Um, one of the things that's worth really pointing out, I think, is, is that such a high percentage of the this generation of Colbert African-American population wound up going on to college. Probably, we figured this up a much higher percentage, percentage-wise. Oh, you know, a much higher percentage than than the probably the the white community surrounding. Um, ended up going to college and getting involved in professional careers and advancing in education. Um, I don't know if you want to speak well, to that. Jim. I was just going to say five in my family graduated from Culver High School. Of that five four was went to college. And I think that says something four is the highest in most of you probably know. I think that says something about the community and also of course about you mentioned exposure to education, working in the academy, the you know, exposure to benefits of education. Um, I think parents who also realize you needed education to become worthwhile to the community or to yourself. Well, I get this strong. Yeah, and I get a strong sense that I'm sure Thelma Hodge is not alone in this, but that she just, yeah, there was no question. I mean, she was going to go out there and do whatever she wanted, regardless of the social situation in the country or around her, um, which is really amazing. And I told the story to a lot of you that as I went through school, uh, it wasn't a question of whether or not you were going to college. The only question is where you were going to go. I, I, I really never was able to think of not going. That was just it. Which again was probably unusual if you pulled the general population of Culver in, in the 1940s. You know, that probably was an unusual attitude. You know. um, so, and, and again, you can see that these are, I mean, there's a, there's a level of integration that was I mean, I'm not without its problems, I'm sure, but um, that was social beyond just a kind of a forced integration, which is really interesting. Yeah, I'm, as a matter of fact, you know, this was this is something I've thought about a lot. You know, we say all the time, but I think it's worth pointing out that this really is the um, this is the lesson of integration, and this is what was supposed to happen in the United States. We kept it from happening. But uh, you wonder, what is it? Black children are dumb? No, black children are not dumb. I taught in Gary, Indiana for years and years, and I've got some of the most brilliant children that you can imagine have come through those schools. But when we segregate, then we I'm just going to say it that way and not be preachy about it. But uh, we do segregate, and I'm not saying you segregate, I'm saying we. It's the world. I don't know what it's about. I haven't figured it out yet. But a mix is the thing that makes a the uh, encourage. You miss that. Maybe you wish to you someday, somebody will figure out how to get it right. <laughs> Well, I think we could go on about this, <laughs> and I'd like to, but I, I think just in case any of you have too much coffee or anything. For those of you I don't know, I'm Bob Price. And my great-grandfather had the big brick wall in the saloon down there. 
apartment. Hmm. And I found in 1897, I think it was a picture that my grandfather is in, and I never knew him because he died when my dad was 10 years old. But it has a picture of a guy in a chef's outfit, and it said, Charlie Rains, our chef. Does anybody recognize the name Charlie Rains? I think he spelled it R-A-I-N-E-S. Does that mean anything to anybody? Was he a Culver guy? I'm familiar with the name, not with the person. Yeah. He was a big guy. He stood taller than anybody else in the group. Okay. <laughs>